Welcome back to Intro Linguistics. Today we're going to start phonology. So we're going to look at minimal pairs, phonemes, allophones, and show some examples of these variations so you understand what allophones are. So, minimal pairs. Minimal pairs uses phonetics. And we find two words that are similar except for one sound, and we see if those words have different meanings. So, this sounds weird coming from an English perspective, but uh, once we do a couple examples, I'll explain how this works with other languages and how it can be useful. So, for instance, we have two words, sip and zip. So, these are two English words, sip and zip. Uh, they differ in this one sound, S and Z, and they mean different things. So, we know that S and Z are separate sounds in English. So we already knew that, but this just gives us evidence. And let's take a look at bit and beat. So this i and this e, we have the word bit, we have the word beat. They mean two different things, so they are minimal pairs, and they are separate in English as well. So when you're looking at a language that you've never seen before, and you see a transcription, like maybe you see this uh, beat, and then you see beat, and they both mean the same thing in another language, this B and this P, this means that they don't make a distinction between these sounds. That's what it means. So we make a distinction between S and Z, we make a distinction between it and E, but another language might not. So that's what minimal pairs tell us. Another important concept in phonology is complementary distribution. So this is where we take two sounds, but they never occur in the same environment. So for instance, um, bit and beat, this i and this e, they both occur after b and before t. So they're not in complementary distribution. They can appear in the same environment. However, when we take a look at bead and beat, in bead, we have this lengthening. We have this lengthening of the I. And in beat, we don't. Now this lengthening occurs before voiced consonants. So we see this in the word C's as well. So for C's, this I is lengthened, this E is lengthened before Z, which is a voiced consonant. But in C's, we don't see this lengthening. So what this means is that this E and this E, they're not minimal pairs. Okay, they're not minimal pairs. So we, do make, we don't make any distinction between them in our meanings. So if we say bead or bead, they're both the same word. So we don't hear a distinction there. However, they don't appear in the same environment. They appear in mutually exclusive environments, which means they will never overlap. So we'll never see this lowercase, or sorry, this, this short E before a voice D, at least in Western Canadian English. This may vary depending on where you are. This is purely an example of Western Canadian English. Okay, so that's complementary distribution. Now, how we use those is important, but first we should talk about phonemes and allophones. So when you don't make a distinction between two sounds, uh, you have this situation where the phoneme, which is the underlying representation, so this is a single sound, they turn into allophones, which are variations of that sound. So this is kind of like, this is the main sound, and these down here are the variations. So we don't hear a difference between the variations in English. So this E and this E, well, we might hear it a little bit, but we don't really make a distinction between it. And these allophones will always occur in different environments. So for instance, this long E occurs before voiced consonants, but the short E will appear in every other environment where that sound is. So we could say that if there's a voiced consonant after it, it lengthens the, the E sound. So these are allophonic variations of the phoneme. So that's the difference. The phoneme is the general main sound, 
and the allophone is the specific sound in certain environments. So let's take a look at English. We have four words here. We have cop, pack, bucket, and accord. So we're looking at these K's here. So this K, the K, the K, and K. What do we notice? Two of these have these aspiration in them. This H at the top is aspiration, meaning when we say K, air flows out of the mouth. Well, when we say pack, uh, there's not really a burst of air at the end, or bucket. There's no burst of air after the K. So, uh, the other thing I should point out is that, of course, these markers here are stress markers. That's where primary stress is, which is important for this analysis. So what's the rule here? We have two Ks, cop, pack, bucket, accord. These are two different Ks. And we don't really make a distinction between them in English. In fact, you might not have even noticed they're different Ks until you saw this video, which is how I felt when I took my first course. Um, so where do these Ks occur? Where, where is the K different from the K? Okay, so we see this aspirated K occurs directly after the stress marker. So um, we could say in, in primary stress syllable, primary stress, that could be a good way we describe it. Um, we might call that the onset because it's the first sound in the syllable. We'll talk about onsets in the next video. Um, so that's the way we could say k. We could say it's in word initial, but we see this accord here. Um, it's the second letter, it's the second syllable, but the stress is there, so we say k. And then for this other k, we'll just say elsewhere. Because we don't want to rule for all the environments. We don't, have, we don't want to say, okay, it could be a k at the end of a word, in the middle of a word. Um, we usually pick the most precise one and say, okay, that super precise scenario is its own rule. And this more general K where it occurs everywhere, that's just the default. So we could say that this phoneme K um, becomes an aspirated K when it's in the onset of the primary stress syllable. Otherwise, it's just regular K. So that's the kind of rule we can say. So that's an English example. Um, You'll see the same thing with a P and a T. It's exactly the same rule. Which, uh, if you know the properties of these sounds, there's not really much of a difference except for their location. So, hey, that's an English variation, kind of a cool thing. So let's take an example from a different language. Okay, so we have the word to cut and to polish. Cut is got. Polish is cut. Now I know if you're an English speaker, you probably heard me say got as a G. That's not a G. That's an unaspirated K. I know, it sounds like a G. It's an unaspirated K. We're very bad at distinguishing between actual Gs and unaspirated Ks. Okay, so what we notice here is that these are actually minimal pairs because these sounds here they're in the same environment, but they mean different things. So we don't make a distinction in English between these two sounds, but in this language here, as long as, as well as many others, there is a distinguish between these sounds. In fact, I think in Korean there is as well. I'm not entirely sure though. So that is why we need to take a look at minimal pairs because when we are facing an exam problem or we're talking to speakers and we see that, oh, there's a K and there's an aspirated K, it must have the same pattern as English. That is simply not true. We should never assume that other languages have the exact same patterns as English. So, in this language, these sounds are separate. In English, they're not. Okay, so here's a data set. Here's seven words on an exam. You might get this. Uh, you probably get more data. You probably get some fillers to throw you off too. Let's take a look at this. How do we approach this? That's what I'm going to teach you here. Is how do you approach this? First of all, you take a look at the IPA description first. Um, all these English words, ignore them at first. So, slip, glim, blue, clip, play, love, flay. Um, what is the common letter we see everywhere here? All these words have L's in them. 
It might be something to do with the vowels, but the first thing I see are L's. Love, flay, play, slip, gleam, blue, clip. Okay, let's take a look at the L's. Let's circle them so we know what we're looking at here. Um, we see two distinctions here. We see this L with the circle under it. Um, so this is not a syllabic L. This is a voiceless L. So, where is this occurring? This is occurring after this K here, and it's occurring after the P. So my first thought is, okay, maybe after voiceless consonants, it is a voiceless L. Okay, so um, if our first rule is after voiceless consonants, we get this L here. Okay, so let's compare it to everything else. Um, okay, slip. Uh, this is a voiceless consonant, so this is a problem. Uh, so it can't be consonants because of this S here. But we take a look at Glim, okay, we're still covered here, we're still covered in blue. Um, clip is good, play is good, love is good. Uh, flay also is a problem because this is also a voiceless consonant. So we have to narrow it down more to this K and this P. So we're going to say it's after voiceless stops or plosives. So after voiceless stops, we get this, um, this uh, unvoiced L or devoiced L. And otherwise, we get just the regular L that we're used to. Uh, I really should not put the slanty brackets. I should put the square brackets. Okay, so maybe that's what we have here. So we looked at the data set. We came up with this hypothesis. And we don't have any more data, so we can't verify it any further. We just have to say, okay, look, this is all the examiner gave us. Uh, that should be enough to solve it. So, those are the exam tips. First, we check to see if it was minimal pairs. And like we did before, but we did the L. We didn't really look for minimal pairs because it's an English example and we know how uh, English makes distinctions between sounds for the most part, so we ignored that part. But with other languages, look for minimal pairs. Uh, look, look for the weird symbols. So, when facing a language you don't know, you have to look for sounds that appear in almost every word. So for instance, this L appeared in every single word, so it's probably the target. We also see this little weird circle under the L, which means that, well, we haven't seen it before. It's probably the focus of the exam question. What is this circle here? What is this weird thing we've never seen before? Well, that's what you're trying to figure out. That's tip number two. Tip number three is when you use rules, which we'll go to um, in a few videos, the rules are for more specific environments. So for instance, when we're given this uh, L distinction here, and we take a look at all these words, should we specify conditions for the voiceless L here? Because it's not in many situations, so maybe the specific, or Maybe when we describe where it occurs, it might be better for these very small environments. Because describing all the environments for this regular L here um, take a lot of work. We'd have to say it's at the beginning of words, it's after voiceless fricatives, it's after voiced stops. Um, it's a lot of environments. So maybe this more specific one is a better way to describe it. So if something occurs in fewer environments, that's probably the one we want to describe. So, for instance, does this L go to the voiceless L in certain situations, or do we default in the voiceless L and turn it into a voiced L in some situations? So that's the distinction you have to make. Um, the simpler the rule, the better. So if you can describe a situation in one rule, do that. Don't describe it in three or four rules, because you're probably not describing the right process then. Okay, so that is first video. Next time we'll tackle syllables. So we'll talk about structure, sonority hierarchy, setting them up, and we're going to take a look at this aspirated K example again with syllables. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I hope to see you in the next video.